So now that we've solved for B, we actually have a fully defined solution for our wave function psi. And I'm just writing it down here just to write it explicitly in where I've got psi of x is equal to the square root of 2 over a times sine n pi x over a. And so now that we have this, we can actually start asking questions like, what is the probability of finding the particle in the first half of our box? Because remember, again, when we deal with quantum mechanics, we're talking about a probabilistic nature of, of, of how the world exists. It isn't deterministic. So we can only speak in terms of the likelihood of finding particles places, not that you will find a particle somewhere because you know its speed and position. Because remember, again, there's an uncertainty that generally says that if you can fix the amount of precision that you know, say, the position, then you don't know its speed. And so it makes it hard to then deterministically know where things are. And so again, we talk about in terms of probability of where we find things. And so just like any probability that we've done before, we would then just say, well, the probability of finding something, in this case it's our particle, between 0 and halfway through a box, which is a over 2 in our case, well, that's just equal to the integral between 0 and a over 2, psi star x times psi of x dx. So again, we have basically this term that's inside the integral. This is interpreted as being a probability distribution. So we know what our psi of x is. Our psi star of x, well, that's just equal to psi of x because there's no complex terms inside um, our, our wave function solution. So there's nothing to change. So it's exactly the same thing. That means then I can then substitute in in this integral. I would have 2 over a, the bounds of integration between 0 and a, and I just have sine squared n pi x over a dx. And I, of course, need to make one quick change because, of course, my bounds of integration are between 0 and a over 2 in this problem. So let's evaluate this integral. 2 over a. In this case, again, I'm going to make my integral. I'm going to use this, the same u substitution that we used before. u is equal to n pi x over a, which means du by dx is equal to n pi over a. This means that dx is equal to a du over n pi. So if I write that directly into here, I have sine squared of u times a du over n pi. I'm going to move my constants out front, but I'll do that in a second. The, next, the first thing that I just wanted to cover, the next thing that I wanted to cover is, since I'm going to evaluate this totally in, in my substituted for my substituted variable, in this case u, I'm going to this time change my bounds of integration. So what that means is that before when we were talking about our variables being in, in terms of x, then that is my bounds of integration are between 0 and a over 2. But if I evaluate this integral and I evaluate the bounds in terms of my substituted variable, I have to take these bounds of integration, my a over 2 and my 0, plug them into my substituted definition to get new bounds of integration. So if I substitute in 0 into this u is equal to n pi x over a, and I substitute 0 in for x, well, that's just n pi times 0 over a, and that just gives me 0. So my lower bound of my integration has not changed. My upper bound, which is just my u for a over 2, well, now I'm going to be plugging in again a over 2, in this case, my a's cancel out. And what that leaves me with is a value that's n pi over 2. So that means my upper bound of my integration is now going to be n pi over 2. And what this means is that when I then finish this integral or I evaluate this integral, and then I go and I apply my fundamental theorem of calculus, meaning I apply the bounds of integration, that I'm not going to substitute back in for x. I can leave this in terms of u. Now let's evaluate this integral. I have all my constants out front. I'm going to have 2 over n pi, and that's just because in this previous part I can cancel out my a's. I know this integral is going to be u over 2 minus the sine of 2u over 4. 
bounds of my integral, or since I'm going to do this in my u coordinate, then it's just between 0 and n pi over 2. That means I'm just going to substitute in directly for those values. So I'm going to get n pi over 4, because I'm going to have 2 times 2 on the bottom, minus the sine of 2n pi over 2, all over 4. From that, I'm going to subtract off 0, because I sub 0 in for u, and I'm going to get 0. And I'm going to subtract off the sine of 0, all over 4. So you can see that many of these terms are going to disappear immediately. I have on the right-hand side, I have 0, and sine of 0 is 0. So those two terms go away. Here I'm going to have the sine of n pi, because I can cancel out the 2 on top and the 2 on the bottom. And the sine of an integer and multiple of pi, well, that's just going to be 0. So what I'm going to be left with in the end is 2 over n pi times n pi over 4. I can then cross off the n pi's, and so I'm just left with 2 over 4, or 1 half. And so what this means is that the probability of finding the particle in the first half of my box is going to be 1 half. I'm 50% likely of finding the particle in the first half of my box. All right, so to summarize, here are four key points that I want you to take away from this lecture. The first is that the time-independent Schrodinger equation represents the stationary state of a particle. Stationary states essentially means that all the observable properties are independent of time. That doesn't mean that the wave isn't vibrating, it's that the properties of the waves aren't changing. For instance, a wave can vibrate and still maintain a constant wavelength. The second point is that the probabilistic interpretation of the wave function introduces a kind of indeterminacy. Quantum mechanics only provides statistical information on possible results. This is why quantum mechanics is not intuitive, because we live in a deterministic world. The third point is that quantization arises naturally from solving the Schrodinger equation. There was absolutely no need to insert it explicitly. It just came about just by solving the wave equation and applying boundary conditions. The fourth and final point is that the particle in a box problem that we solved in this lecture can be used to describe electrons in conjugated double bonds, among other things. And so this is then one way that we can explain the observable spectra that we might measure from systems that involve these conjugated double bonds.